Hello and welcome to my first video in the Elemental Extraction series. And of course we're going to start with hydrogen, the first element. Hydrogen is a gas at room temperature and it's invisible, so samples of it are not terribly exciting usually. So this is mine. Uh, it's in a glass vial and looks like there's nothing in there and honestly there probably isn't anything in there anymore because uh, it's only sealed by duct tape. So I, I bet you the hydrogen escaped by now. But it used to have hydrogen in there um, and I should probably ampule it to, uh, to keep it permanently but maybe that's for another time. First of all, I wanna talk about something that I'm probably not gonna address in other videos, and that's isotopes. So isotopes are the same element, so it has the same number of protons, same number of electrons, but they have different numbers of neutrons, so they weigh slightly differently. Their chemical properties are identical, but they weigh just a tiny bit, bit different. And for most elements, that doesn't matter so much. Uh, like for uranium, when you, the difference between 238 and 235 is minuscule, because it's only it's a tiny percentage of its mass. Uh, but for hydrogen, it's actually a pretty big percentage. Regular hydrogen is called protium. It's got one proton and one electron, and that's it. Then there's also deuterium, which has one proton and one neutron and one electron. And that actually weighs twice as much as regular hydrogen. Being that there's such a huge mass difference, it's actually relatively easy to separate the two. And there's videos on how to do that, uh, making heavy water, which I would love to try at some point. It just takes a very, very long time. So it probably would take a while for me to get a video out on it. Um, anyways, there's, there's protium, deuterium, and I actually have the third one, which is tritium. Tritium is actually radioactive, so it very slowly decays. And what this is, is a keychain that's got a very tiny amount of tritium gas inside of it. So you can see there's a little vial in the, in the center there that looks a little green because it's got a coating of a phosphor that changes the radioactive emissions of the tritium into visible light. And so I hope you'll be able to see this, but I'll try to maybe cover this up and so you can maybe see it glowing in there. These things are sold to find your keys in the dark, basically. But what's cool about this is it's not like a reg regular glow-in-the-dark thing. You know, you don't have to expose this to light for it to glow. It just does. And it's going to continue glowing for probably about 25 years. And that's incredible considering how tiny of an amount of actual tritium is in this thing. So that's enough about hydrogen as an element. Let's actually get on to do some chemistry. The first reaction I'm going to show to isolate hydrogen is a pretty classic one and that's isolating it from an acid using a metal. So you do a reaction of just about any acid with just about any metal, and it produces hydrogen gas as one of the products. Now, of course, there's lots of exceptions to that, but there's several metals that do it and several acids that do it. So I'm going to use the probably the most classic one, and that's the reaction of sulfuric acid with zinc. They're just very thin, high surface area, so they'll be good for this. So we're gonna put a couple of pieces of zinc into the test tube here, I gotta crack these in half because they won't fit. And now to that, we'll add some 4.4 molar sulfuric acid. This is actually battery acid, so it should be pretty easy to get a hold of. The zinc was also over the counter, by the way. I got that from a, a boat anode. But we just add the acid to the metal, and we should get a reaction to start pretty much immediately. So as you can see, we're getting a pretty vigorous reaction between the acid and the zinc. And what this is doing is forming zinc sulfate and hydrogen gas, and that's the bubbles that you're seeing. And now what I'm doing is I put a cap on the test tube very loosely, of course, since it's generating gas, I don't want it to build pressure. And we're trying to accumulate some of this hydrogen gas because of course, hydrogen is much lighter than air, so it would just fly out of the test tube and we wouldn't be able to collect it. Now that this has been accumulating for a few minutes, let's see if we actually have any hydrogen by doing the gas test for it. And the test for hydrogen is by taking a lit splint and immersing it in the gas, and we should hear a nice little pop. So let's try that. <laughs> These gas tests are probably one of my favorite things in chemistry, so let's try that again. Oh! But it turns out that there's a much more abundant source of hydrogen, and that's water. Water, of course, is H2O, so it's got plenty of hydrogen all around us, and it turns out it's very, very easy to extract it. And you can do that via electrolysis. So this is just a beaker with two carbon rods in it that are hooked up to my power supply over here. And now we just need water. And that's going to be a jug of distilled water that I just bought from Walmart. So now let's just go ahead and fill that up with distilled. And theoretically, this electrolysis takes uh, negative 1.23 volts to work. 
So let's see if that happens. So let's turn this on. And slowly raise the voltage, and uh, we'll see at what point it starts to form bubbles. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine volts, seven. Almost 12 volts, and there's no reaction. Now, why do you think that would be? Well, that, of course, is because distilled water is non-conductive. There's no ions in there to conduct the electricity. So we need to add an electrolyte. And the choice of electrolyte is actually pretty important because the, both parts of the electrolyte have to have a lower standard electrode potential than hydrogen does for the cation and hydroxide for the anion. Otherwise, we'll be reducing the salt instead of our target of the water. And there's a number of things that'll suffice for that. I mean, you can use Epsom salt, uh, magnesium sulfate, baking soda, which is sodium hydrogen carbonate. Uh, regular table salt can be used with a caveat. Um, if you use too much table salt, then it'll start electrolyzing that and you'll get chlorine instead. And you can also use strong acids or strong bases. And that's one of the one I'm going to use is a strong acid since we have it already. Go back to the old 4.4 uh, molar sulfuric acid. And that's got the benefit of the cation being hydrogen, so that doesn't change anything. And sulfate is very hard to change in electrolysis, so there's, that's not going to do anything either. So we'll just add uh, roughly seven or eight milliliters of this, just a couple of pipette foals. Uh, you don't really need a ton of electrolyte, just enough to make the solution conductive. Let's give that a good stir to mix everything. So now let's give that another try. Turn the current back on, and again, slowly increase the voltage, and we'll see at what point a reaction begins to occur. Ah, could see some bubbles forming on the negative electrode. That was at, that was around 2.3. That's roughly double the, the theoretical standard voltage, but let's, let's increase the voltage a little bit more, see if we can't get a higher uh, speed to this reaction. Let's go to about 6 volts maybe. I've heard that anything above 6 volts is generally bad for your electrodes, so we'll, we'll leave it at that maybe. But you can see we're generating uh, bubbles, so we've got a reaction happening, and that's great. Um, it's significantly higher than the standard electrode potential, so why might that be? In practice, the reaction is actually kinetically controlled, so it's affected a lot by the ion mobility, like the type of electrode that you have and how easy the ions are able to move around, uh, the concentration of the electrolyte, electrode resistance, the resistance of the materials that we use here, uh, the surface area that's available for the reaction to happen on, and probably most importantly is the surface area is affected by the bubbles. So you can see that this, this electrode in particular is completely covered by bubbles. And of course that gas is going to be a barrier to the reaction happening. So since there's so many bubbles here, I think that is going to be the driver of slowing this reaction down quite a bit. So now I've got the system set up to capture the gases that we've produced. And this, this was a, a bit of a hassle, so I didn't film it, but basically I have two test tubes that I filled with the solution and uh, put my thumb on them and then quickly inverted them and put it under the solution. The, the idea being to fill the tubes with the liquid without having any bubbles in them, which I managed to do somehow. <laughs> and uh, I also, you might notice, I had to lengthen the wires here because I have a chronic problem of making wires too short. So, but we're always set to go, I think. So I had hoped by putting the electrodes up inside the test tubes, I'd be able to you know, capture more gas. But clearly you can see that the reaction is only happening below the level of the test tubes. It's because the uh, solution in the test tubes way up here isn't able to circulate as well. So the ions aren't able to travel all the way around. So they're going the path of least resistance, which is going straight across. But I think this will be okay. So after just 10 minutes, the hydrogen test tube is already completely full of gas. You can see it's about to bubble out the bottom there. <laughs> um, the oxygen test tube, however, is another example of why practice is a bit different than theory. Theoretically, since it's H2O, we should have half a test tube of oxygen, right? Since we have a full test tube of hydrogen, should have half of one of this. But you can see just a real small amount of oxygen was captured. And that's more my fault than anything. I just, when we started this, my oxygen electrode was not very well positioned. So I think I missed a lot of the bubbles. But that's okay, because we're concerned with hydrogen in this video. 
The big advantage of this method is that we know that the hydrogen is pure. Before, there was some, you know, there's still air in the test tube when we were doing the zinc reaction. So there was probably a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of nitrogen, just other impurities around in there. This, however, is completely pure hydrogen with a bit of water vapor, of course, but that's not too bad. All right, now that we've got our hydrogen ready, let's do another gas test on it and just make sure that it is what we think it is. Okay. I got a lit splint. Let's test it. Ah, it's a good pop. So there you have it. We've successfully extracted hydrogen from both uh, metal and an acid reaction and electrolysis of water. So thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next time. The big advantage of this method is that we, the big advantage of this method, the big advantage of this method, oh my God.